Good morning, everyone. I am re-recording this lecture because um, the video capture recorded off the wrong screen. Yay. So it has everyone's chat for the past hour. It does not actually have the, <laughs> the PowerPoint presentation. Don't know how that happened, but we're re-recording now. So uh, today I, I just put together a review of set theory. It's all stuff that you've you've done before. The, the main thing to uh, know before we go any further is your capstone essay is coming up. The capstone essay is on Canvas. It's live. It's due in about a week or so. And what you have to do for the capstone essay is um, write, I think it's a thousand words. It's like three to four pages. Pay really close attention to the word count. If The easiest way of failing this assignment is to not meet the word count. Um, so there's a lot of requirements on the in the um, in Canvas that detail what you need to do. Uh, you're going to talk about social issues in computer science and fallacies and things like that. All the stuff we've been talking about all semester it shouldn't be hard. You've been doing discussion forums all all semester. It's not it's not a big deal. Just it, it's longer. Okay. The other ones are this big, and the new one's going to be like this big. It's probably probably about two to three times the length of what we've done so far. And then when you finish it, you need to submit it to your GE portfolio. So I don't have a GE portfolio. I can't really help you with that. There is a link to an email address in the, uh, uh, for, that's the GE coordinator who can, who can help you with that. If you have any questions about how to submit it, it's your, it makes up your critical thinking, um, GE requirement for the portfolio. So make sure you do it. It's kind of the whole point of this class from the college's perspective is that you demonstrate your knowledge of critical thinking by showing your understanding fallacies and of social issues in computer science. Okay. So, and then you'll do a peer review on that. So you have a week to do the essay and you have another week after that to do the peer review. And then that's basically the end of the semester. Um, okay. So what I did was I put together a new PowerPoint presentation for you all on set theory, simply because a lot of you on chat were saying I, I need more help with it. So we're just going to run through this and just review. I made a whole new slideshow just for y'all. Okay. So to recap, a set is a collection. Okay. Things are either in the set or they're not in the set. The order that you write the set doesn't matter. Everything in the universe is either in the set or not in the set. That's the defining element of a set. Either something's in the set or it's on the set. Set of all humans. I'm in the set. I'm not a android or something. You know, Zuckerberg, <laughs> he's he's in the set as well. You know, people joke about him not being human, but I'm, I'm pretty sure he's human. So uh, if we define a set, and for whatever reason, we, we typically use capital letters to define sets. I'm not, not really sure why, but we do. So if we define a set Q that's all Inca singers born in 1971, then Naya Shamaz is in the set. Taylor Swift and myself are not in the set. Uh, even though um, <laughs> I did, uh, here we go, here's an Inca singer. I don't think she was born in 1971 though. Um, I showed my uh, other class this, this video. So I am uh, um, in the virtual choir for, uh, for this one. There's a lot of going, oh, like that for two hours and submitting it to them. And then they mix me in with four other uh, people in the base section. It's like, oh, oh, <laughs> two hours of that. So I am not an Inca singer, though, born in 1971. Uh, set A is all fruits, beginning with the letter B. So bananas in the set. Taylor Swift and myself are not in the set. I am not a fruit beginning with the letter B, believe it or not. Um, B is Jeep, Pinto, and Mustang. I'm not in that set, and Taylor Swift isn't either. Cool. E is a set with nothing in it. I'm not in that set either, so I'm in none of these sets. Okay. Uh, neither is Taylor Swift, for that matter. Okay. So the most basic thing you can do with a set is ask, is something in it? And I don't think we went over the little weird E symbol before. Uh, it's like a little epsilon kind of, kind of looking thing. And, uh, what it means is, you know, something is a member of that set. So if A is the numbers from one to three, three is a element of A. That's what the E means. It means element of, element of means it's a member of the set. 
So three is an element of A, five is not. Okay. So element of kind of returns true and false, if you want to think of that. So um, It's a yes, no question. Okay. Is something in the set, yes or no? Okay. The, uh, the other basic thing we can do with a set is ask the size of it. And this is the thing that gets students over and over again. It's the absolute value bars. It's like, I don't, I don't know what it is, but like, if I write the set without the absolute value bars, it's just the set. What is A? A is the numbers from one to three. What is the size of A? The size of A is three. Okay. So the absolute value bars are how big a set is. And for whatever reason, like that just gets mentally erased by students over and over again. And I, you know, I don't know how to make it more clear, but when you see the absolute value bars, you just count all the elements in the set and whatever count you end up with, that's, that's the size. So there's one, two, three elements in A, absolute value bars, size of A, three. Okay. For the numbers from zero to hundred, including zero and hundred, the square brackets mean including, it's parentheses means non-including the zero and non-including the 100 if I put them on both sides. In this case, it's square brackets, though. Square brackets means it's inclusive. It's 0 to 100 inclusive, including 0 and 100. So there are 101 elements in this. 0 plus 1 to 100. Okay, so... Uh, can you chat messages? Cool. Um, all right. Uh, what is not in the set is indicated with the exponent C again. I apologize for the, the symbol terminology. I don't know. I don't know why it is, but it is. It looks like you're taking A to the C of power. You're not. This means everything not in A. A complement. It means the set of everything in the universe that's not in A. So if uh, 3 is an element of A, 3 is not an element of A complement and vice versa. So if five is an element of, uh, if uh, five is not an element of A, then five is an element of A complement. So the answer to this is no, the answer to this is yes, right? And so everything in A is not an A complement, everything not in A is in A complement. They're evil twins or something. No. Yep. So if B is uh, the numbers from zero to 100, the size of all integers not from zero to 100 is infinite. It's technically Aleph null, the fair universe is uh, all integers, but uh, you don't need to know about Aleph null for this class, just say infinite. On Canvas, I'll typically say if the size is infinite, type in negative one, that's not a math thing, that is a Canvas thing, because it doesn't accept the infinity symbol or whatever. So. Okay. Um, yeah, so B complement is all numbers not in this range here. So 200 is in it, negative 200 is in it, 500 is in B complement, negative 500 is in B complement. There are an infinite number of numbers that are not from 0 to 100. Does that make sense? Right. There's 1,000 and 2,000 and 3,000. Those are all in B complement. So the size of B complement is infinite. There are an infinite number of integers not from 0 to 100 inclusive. Okay, so the empty set is represented with the Danish zero. I don't know what the technical term for that is. It's the null character. And we sometimes write it as like just open, close, empty bracket, uh, like an empty, we, we, we indicate the empty set with just a bracket with nothing in it. That's pretty common so that you don't have to look up the Unicode character for, for that. Um, uh, or you can write it inside of brackets like that. Either way, it's the same terminology. And that just means there's nothing in A. Okay. So pretty pretty simple. Means there's nothing in it. And so everything's in the complement. Right? So if A is the empty set, is 3 in it? Nope, nothing's in it. It will return false for every element of operation. There's nothing in A. Now for A complement, it will return true for all of those because everything is in A complement. And uh, most notably, zero and the null character are not the same. These are not at all the same thing. This is the number zero. This is null set. It means empty set. So zero is not an element of A. Okay. 
Zero is not an element of A. Oh, I got somebody at the door. I'll be right back. And back. Sorry about that. Getting some work done my house. So uh, the name of the slide is More Funny Symbols. And uh, that's really the hardest part of set theory. I don't think any of the, the concepts themselves are really that hard. It just looks like a foreign language. And I don't know. Not, not sure why exactly. Um, these things are... Like, I, I know why they're hard to understand, because it looks like you're taking A to the C power, you know? Like, that's just, and this looks like absolute value. Like, I, I understand why it's hard. I just don't know why it was made that way, you know? Like, all right, so intersection is when you, um, it takes two sets as input, it returns one set as output. And the output set is all elements that are found in both of them. So in this case, uh, A is one, two, and three, B is two, three, and four. So you can see the number two and the number three appear in both of them. Okay, so the output set is gonna be two and three. All right. And one thing to mention here is that the order of the set doesn't matter. Like I could have written this, um, I could have written this uh, three, two, one, and we'd get the same, the same result. The way that you write a set doesn't matter. We typically alphabetize it just to make it easier to read, but um, it, it literally doesn't matter what order you put the set in. So the intersection is going to be two and three. And then union takes two sets as input and returns one set as output. And it just returns all the elements of A and all the elements of B together, but not no duplicates. That's, that's the tricky part. That's why I bolded that in there. Is the, um, a lot of people will be like, oh, the union of them is one, two, three, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. Remember, something's either in the set or it's on the set. It's either in the set. And so you, you can't have it in twice, right? You can't you can't be a member of, you know, a set twice. You're just either in the set or you're not in the set. So in this case, uh, the union of A, uh, a and B is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4. Right. So subset takes two sets as input, but returns true or false. Okay? It doesn't return a set like the other ones. It returns true or false. And so it is true if all the elements of the first one are in the second one. So A is the number, uh, the set containing the numbers one, two, and three. B is the numbers from zero to 100. A is the subset of B, because all the elements of A, one, two, and three, are found within B. Because B is zero, one, two, three, four, six, seven, nine, 10, all the way up to 100. B is not a subset of A, because there are elements in B that are not found in A. So A is, um, so for example, uh, men are a subset of humanity, Teenagers are a subset of all students at Fresno State. Um, uh, uh, Rob Hobart's books are a subset of all books on my bookshelf right now. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's not the case though that um, what do I not have on my bookshelf? Dungeons and Dragons, Player's Handbook, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, so the Player's Handbook for Dungeons and Dragons 5th Edition is not a subset. Uh, it's a set with just one element in it, right? Um, it's not a subset of the set of all books on my bookshelf, because it's not on there. So. Subsets are part of the just technical language we use in, in real life all the time. And uh, set theory is broadly applicable. It, it, it just comes up in like every industry, every field you're in. If you're in law... Um, you know, you'll, you'll see things like, um, you know, uh, protected sets, protected classes, which is a set of all people that can't be discriminated against based on, uh, usually some immutable characteristic. Um, and then you can do what's called intersectionality, which is when you intersect two different, two different groups of people, um, to create new groups, which arguably could be discriminated against. Um, so subsets though, when we use the word subset in English, which again comes up all the time across all disciplines, typically we, we, we use it to mean proper subset. We usually mean it to mean a group smaller than the original because technically A is a subset of A, right? Because all elements of A are in A. So it's technically a subset. We, in English, we usually don't use it that way. When we say subset, we usually mean a smaller group within a group. Like if you have a Venn diagram, it's a smaller circle within the bigger circle. So, uh, you know, Emperor Foxtrot here 
is a proper subset of all of uh, the stuffed animals we have in this house. My daughter and I hide a uh, foxtrot in different places to surprise the other. So uh, that is indicated with this symbol instead of that symbol. It's kind of like the less than symbol versus the less than or equal symbol. It kind of, if you look at it, it kind of looks the same. Uh, so A is a subset of A, but A is not a proper subset of A because it's equal. Right. So it's uh, a proper subset is a subset that's smaller. Another way of putting it is it's, it's, it's a subset that's not equal. So it's not uh, equal to itself. Right. So A is the numbers from 1, 2, and 3. So smooth parentheses has got people during the live chat. Um, A is not the same as B. A and B are not equal sets, right? Uh, because this is the inclusive set, if you guys remember this from algebra. So B is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. A is 1, 2, 3. Because the parentheses mean not including 0, and the 4 means not including the 4. Okay. Whereas the square brackets mean including. So this is an inclusive set, so it's including 0 and 4. So A is a subset of B. A is a proper subset of B. Okay. So A is the numbers from 1 to 3 and B is the numbers from 0 to 4. They look very similar, don't get them confused. Yay! Confusing terminology for the win. Okay. All elements of A are in B. A is smaller. A is a proper subset of B. Okay. Alright, so let's do some exercises. A is apple, banana, delta. B is banana, charlie, delta. The size of A and the size of B. Size of A is 3. Size of B is 3. Banana, charlie, delta. So when you do the size of operation, you count, basically. One, two, three. It's three. So. Is A a subset of B? Is B a subset of A? Uh, a is not a subset of B because A has elements that are not in B. It's got Apple. And B is not a subset of A because it's got Charlie. Charlie is not a member of A, so it is not a subset. So this is no to both of them. The intersection of the two are the elements found in common between A and B. And again, I, I alphabetize them for convenience. They don't have to be alphabetized. Uh, banana and delta appear in both. So remember the output of a set intersection is a set itself. Uh, the union of the two is all the elements removing duplicates. So it's going to be apple, banana, delta. Banana is a duplicate. Get rid of that one. Charlie, you can get rid of that one because that's a duplicate delta. So it's Apple, banana, uh, Charlie, Delta, or you can write it in the order you want because the order doesn't matter. Okay. A is the numbers from 0 to 10. B is the numbers from 0 to 100. Size of A is 11. Don't forget that off by one error. The zero counts. Uh, what is the size of B? 101. If it was the numbers from 1 to 100, it would be 100. But we got one more. We got the zero. So it's 101. Very common mistake people make is um, that off by one error. You know, we start counting at zero. Uh, is A a subset of B? Yes. Is B a subset of A? No. All the elements of A are in B, so A is a subset of B. What is the intersection? The intersection of the two is going to just be the numbers from zero to ten. So in other words, A. Okay. So zero through ten are in both A and B. Ninety-nine is not in both. Eighty is not. The only numbers that are in both A and B is zero to ten. So you just write down A if you wanted. That's the answer. The union of the two is B. <laughs> right? So all the elements removing duplicates, all the elements in A are duplicates. It's just it's B. All right. Um, this one's a bit tricky. It requires math, which got some people during the live chat. So A is all people in America right now. B is all people in Europe right now. I'm pretty sure these are disjoint sets. I'm pretty sure... There's nobody both in America and Europe right now. It could be wrong. There might be some place where it's like the four corners where you got your two arms, your two legs, and two different, you know, your, your two arms are in two states, your two legs are in two different states, and you're in four states. I don't think there's any place where you do that with America and Europe, but I, I could be wrong. But for the sake of this argument, let's just assume they're disjoint. If you're in America, you're not in Europe. If you're in Europe, you're not in America. Okay. It's 330 million people in America, 750 million people in Europe, 7.9 billion people in the world. What is the size of A? 330 million. What's the size of A complement? Our universe is people, people on earth, I guess. And so 
how many people on Earth are not in America? This is this is what got people on chat because they didn't want to have to actually do math. But it's seven point nine billion minus three uh, hundred and thirty million, which is seven point five seven. Right, seven point five seven billion plus point three three is seven point nine. Is A a subset of B? No. These are just... Like, there's... No. None, none of the elements in A are in B. And none of the elements in B are in A. So, no. Uh, what is the intersection of A and B? Nothing. There's nobody that's both in America and Europe right now. It's an empty set. Null set. Uh, what is the intersection of the two? Uh, the intersection... Well, the size of the intersection of the two. Don't forget those absolute value bars. The intersection of the two is... Not people in the world. Mm -mm. There's people in Africa. Don't forget them. Don't forget people in Asia. Don't forget the dozen or so people in Antarctica. And then you've got, of course, Australia, all the uh, islands and all that stuff too. Um, yeah, so a lot of people just went, oh, it's 7.9 billion. No, 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 there's more than America in Europe. Sorry. So uh, you just have to add the two. What? No. 1.08 billion. Do the math. <laughs> No, they were all so easy until now. Yeah, you gotta you gotta add sometimes. All right, so A is all odd integers. Odd integers are of the form two n plus one. Even numbers are of the form two n, where n is a natural number, or something like that, or an integer technically, I guess. So uh, zero, by the way, this came up during chat. Some people were like, zero is an odd number. I'm like, no, no, it doesn't follow the form. There's no integer that you can put in here that you'll get zero. It is even, because you put in zero here, it's zero. Yep. So uh, A is a lot of integers, B is zero to 10. The intersection of the two is gonna be all odd integers that are also between zero and 10. So one, three, five, seven, nine. Okay. So that's the set, that's the intersection. The size of the set is five. One, three, five, seven, nine. There's Five odd numbers between 0 and 10 inclusive. The union of the two is just B, right? And because uh, all these guys are... Oh, no, no, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> no. The union of the two is all odd integers and all the numbers from 0 to 10. So it's all on removing duplicates. So um, it, the union of the two is all odd integers. So negative one, negative three, negative five, one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, fifteen, seventeen, nineteen, infinite, plus zero, two, four, six, eight. So got a couple, couple even numbers sprinkled in amongst the infinite set of all odd integers. The size of this is infinite. It's aleph null. Sideways eight, infinity symbol, or on Canvas for your quizzes, you type in negative one, which is not mathematical like, correct but it makes it easy for you to enter an infinite okay so um so yeah so i was talking a little bit about intersectionality a little bit earlier so you might you might have heard this term come up a lot especially with all the debate right now over like critical race theory and things like that so what intersectionality is is uh there's a professor at ucla in columbia Yeah, um, named Kimberly Crenshaw, who uh, got interested in this topic after reading some legal opinions after some people, uh, this is like a little bit, this isn't the exact situation, but it kind of demonstrates the point. Uh, people at a, a black woman at a, at a company sued for discrimination. They said, look, this company's not hiring black women. Uh, so assume the population in the area is half black, half white, black and white fallacy, literally. Uh, half women, half men, and a, 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 a according to uh, people who believe in equality of outcome, the company should hire pretty close to these numbers, right, within the margin of error on, on all four categories. So if you're if the population you're hiring from is half black, half white, half women, half men, this is the proper distribution that you should be hiring. People that believe in equality of opportunity say it doesn't matter what the outcomes are. What matters is they're given equal opportunities to to apply, but a lot of the uh, discrimination lawsuits and things like that, just look at the outcomes instead, for better or worse. 
So uh, what Crenshaw, Dr. Crenshaw found was that they were hiring uh, no black, well, well, she didn't find it. She was, I think, reading this um, uh, legal opinion. And the, and the judge actually found there was no discrimination. And the reason why was because women are a protected class and, and being black is a protected class and white technically is too. Uh, although nobody seems to talk about this, this number being zero, right? It's a bit, bit odd. Um, but uh, the judge is like, you can't just intersect categories and make a new category to be protected. Only Congress can do that. And, um, you know, like there, this company is still hiring half women. This company is still hiring half black people. So there's no discrimination. And so they ruled against the plaintiffs in this lawsuit that said, you're not hiring black women. And, um, I, I've read her paper on it and there's actually multiple legal cases. And one of them was a matter of seniority and they were firing, like they hired a bunch of black women after, uh, they started uh, after they got rid of discrimination, but then when they had layoffs, they laid off people based on um, tenure, like their their seniority of the company. So the people that they were hired to solve the discrimination problems were fired first because they were they were a later hire, and so the people that have been with the company since before, you know, um, the civil rights movement were permitted to stay, which was like a reverse, like going back in time kind of thing. It's kind of uh, interesting. But yeah, basically what she came up with was the notion of intersectionality. And, and even though we use intersection at, like in the set theory, which is why I put it here in the set theory thing, uh, she actually thought of it as just like people standing at the intersection of roads. So you have one road for black and white, one road for men and women. And and she said they're ignoring the, the intersection. I actually see it in set theory terms, right? It's um, What's happening here is that when you do the intersection of black and the set of all black people and the intersection of women is that it's, they're not hiring any black women or white men, but again, they don't ever seem to talk about that. So, uh, the, you know, when you, when you look at things from this lens, like it can reveal discrimination that you can't, if you're not doing the set intersection tests, the, uh, criticism of this is that you can sort of infinitely intersect sets, right? Like you can, um, you know, you've got age, um, age discrimination is a thing. You can't discriminate uh, based on old age. You can discriminate, you can, you can discriminate against people because of young age. It's, it's kind of weird to me, but, um, like from an ethical standpoint, like how is that allowed? You know, like that, you know, whatever, uh, the, um, you know, uh, sexual orientation, there's a, there's a bunch of protected categories. And so, you know, one of the criticisms of intersectionality is you keep intersecting things until you get down to zero. Right. And, um, and then you'd be like, look, they're, they're discriminating, but, and you can sort of generate an infinite number of intersections and you can find some intersection where they don't have somebody that meets all the different criteria, you know, a white person who's, uh, you know, homosexual, it's female that is a Catholic that, you know, you can, you can basically create an infinite number of categories and find discrimination where maybe none exists. Maybe it's all just statistical noise at a certain point. Once you get down into the quantum mechanics levels of math, you know, when you when you look at 9,000 different sets, you know, some of them are not going to be within the statistical margin of error. So it's something that I think that you need to be uh, careful. I, I, I think it's actually quite revealing. Like, you know, like there's clearly discrimination against both black women and white men, you know, here um but at the same time like when you just start you know adding too many set intersection tests um then you you can just start discovering discrimination when there is when there is none right and um it, it, basically it, you'd have to take probability and stats to understand why that is but basically um if you run enough tests you can generate false positives is, is kind of the the summary of that um, you know, in science, we typically use a 95% confidence interval or, uh, we have to be 95% certain that our result is due to a result, not due to chance. So what you can do is you just run 20 experiments, right? And then one of them will be significant maybe and then you publish it. So it's the same idea here. Um, another area where intersectionality, uh, or intersect set intersection comes up 
is with uh, H2B visas. H2B visas are issued uh, f temporary foreign uh, workers to come over to America and, and fill staffing needs, staffing shortages in America. So uh, you're not allowed to hire an H2B visa worker in America if there's an American willing to take that job. That said, a lot of companies um, prefer hiring H2B visa workers because they can pay them less, although I think the uh, Trump regulations actually prohibited paying uh, H2B visa workers less, uh, but more because you can treat them like absolute crap because if they quit because you're treating them like crap, uh, they get deported. And uh, this is not just an America thing. Like, I am not dogging on America. This is a problem everywhere such guest worker programs exist. It happens in Japan. They're called uh, training programs, and they hire people at below prevailing wages to train them and treat them like crap. And then if they complain and quit, well, deport. You know, we'll get another one. And um, absolutely no no rights, no tenure. It's, it's a pretty jacked up situation. Korea has a similar thing. If you saw Squid Squid Game, there's a guest worker from, I think, Pakistan in, uh, in Squid Game. It gets done, done dirty a little bit. So, um, yeah, so the, so the way the companies do this, and I, I've seen a talk on it, uh, is you have to run an ad for, uh, to hire an American. All right. So you can't, you can't hire an HGB visa worker until you've demonstrated that no Americans can meet the requirements. And so you have to run an ad and then show that the, you know, nobody applied for it. All right. Or maybe if you're hiring 500 people, like two people apply for it. Like, look, we have a shortage of 498 we need to bring in from overseas. And so the trick, though, because, again, they prefer H2B visa workers because they have, like, they're essentially slaves to a certain extent, um, is what they do is they, they intersect the job requirements. to They over-intersect <clears throat> down to a point where nobody can meet the requirements. <clears throat> and so what they do is they'll say... Um, you know, you have to know C++. All right, cool. And, you know, you have to know Java. All right, cool. And you have to have 20 years experience management. And you have to have the ability to run a marathon. And you have to have, uh, you know, you have to have been a senator. I, I'm being a bit ridiculous, but um, they what they do is they overlap so many different categories that by the time you're done, like, basically no American is going to meet the requirements. And even if they do apply, they'll just be like, oh, you don't meet the requirements, dismiss them. And then they're like, oh, look, there's all these requirements. And then you just bring people from overseas and fill them. So it's a it's kind of a shady, scandalous thing that uh, a number of companies do in that regard. And they use the powers of set theory for evil instead of for good. So um, It can be pretty ridiculous at times, too. Like, um, if you ever... My, my advice to students, by the way, is just to apply for something, even if you don't meet all the hard requirements because a lot of times the hard requirements aren't hard requirements and um, you can uh, maybe get hired anyway so um, you know if if a company gets in trouble with the labor department um, they might have to hire you you know like, why did you dismiss this person they met six out of the seven you're hiring all these it should be visa people six out of seven right so so always, always worth a shot. You know, you, it doesn't cost money to apply to a company. To, so go for it. Um, yeah. So another another famous uh, story is uh, you know, people make some sort of computer science framework or something. And they search for jobs for that framework because they're pretty qualified for it. You know, I, I made, you know, this networking suite or something. And then they apply for a company you know, that uses the framework, that's hiring for the framework they made, and they get rejected because they don't have enough years of experience on the framework. We're looking for people with 10 years of experience. Like, bro, I wrote I wrote it four years ago. Like, like nobody has 10 years of experience with it. I'm the I'm the person who made it, you know. So sometimes, sometimes those job requirements can be quite um, nonsense, I should say. Okay, so that's it for today. Uh, make sure you get your critical thinking essay done uh, for... Um, next week, make sure you meet, make sure you meet the word count requirements. The, um, the word count is kind of the most important part there. And then just read, read the directions carefully. It, it, it's, 
no, really no different from what you've done before. This peer review and all that stuff. Just make sure you get it done on time, and um, and you follow the directions very carefully, and then you'll get a name. It'll be great. You submit it for your G portfolio. You get that taken care of. You can graduate. It'll be wonderful. All right. So that's it for today. I will see you guys on Wednesday. Peace out.